So Crusoe Energy Systems helps oil companies turn wasted energy or flare gas into a useful resource. Now, a lot of people who are not actively following the space have no clue how oil and gas relate to Bitcoin mining. So let's start by just breaking down how this actually works in real terms. In the most basic terms, um, there's more than 10 billion cubic feet of natural gas being flared every day around the globe. Um, that's enough enough wasted energy to power the Bitcoin network more than eight times over. Uh, and the reason why this happens is because often oil wells are drilled searching for oil and gas is a byproduct of most oil production. And in many cases, most cases, that gas has a pipeline available to go to a traditional market, uh, power generation, heating, um, that, that kind of traditional end use market. But in, in some percentage of the cases, uh, globally, it's as much as 20% of the oil produced is produced in a place where there isn't sufficient gas pipeline takeaway uh, or none at all. And that gas is flared. Um, so it, it varies regionally, you know, but in every continent, you're going to see different percentages of gas being flared. And in aggregate, it's a huge volume. So what we do at Crusoe, we really pioneered this idea of bringing large scale power generation and modular data centers for Bitcoin mining to the wellhead. So really bringing the demand for power to the place where the energy is being wasted and capturing that otherwise flared wasted natural gas uh, has a, a number of benefits that the most important ones really to me personally are first flaring does not fully combust methane. Methane is a super powerful greenhouse gas. It's methane is 82 and a half times as powerful as CO2 at trapping heat. Um, our, our process of power generation does combust 99.9% .9 of the methane. That's called stoichiometric combustion. It, it's, it, it entails the right mixture of fuel and air to get that full combustion. Second, well, second, it's it's just a it's a use of an otherwise wasted energy resource. So without having to tap the grid um, or, or really do anything in terms of of, of a new uh, a new energy production or extraction process, we're just making use of what's already being wasted in the production of of other resources. So you've deployed more than 80 data centers, many of which are in the Bakken, an area that spreads across Montana, the Dakotas, and into Canada. So why there? The Bakken in particular is really was our first home, and that's an area where the, the takeaway gas lines that take most of the gas to other markets at, at periods in history, they get full and they just can't accept any more gas molecules. And so there's there are a lot of oil wells being drilled and um, there have been periods in the Bakken's history where that basin flares 20 percent or more of the natural gas that it produces. Um, but the state really does care about trying to reduce those flared volumes. The operators care. And it's a place where we were sort of welcomed with open arms. All right, if you can bring a solution that makes sense um, economically and operationally to eliminate these flaring volumes, let's let's do that. And so time and again, we found that, you know, operators, especially the larger public and private operators uh, needed a scale solution. And we could bring that to them, you know, millions of cubic feet per day at a site. Uh, we, we can do those kinds of volumes, and we have been doing that in the Bakken for several years now. I mean, what are the dynamics like? So you're coming actually onto the oil pad with these trailers full of thousands of Bitcoin miners? Yeah, so we have really two key components of our system. There's a power generation system, uh, which is these, these are large scale power generation systems that are either reciprocating engines or turbines. Um, they take the rich natural gas. Uh, relatively untreated. We've got a system designed to handle a variety of, of wellhead gas conditions coming directly from the wellhead and, and, and fully and cleanly combust that um, to create electricity. And the second component is the modular data centers, which from the outside look fairly similar to a shipping container, but on the inside, they're very heavily engineered with network engineering, electrical engineering, you know, air handling, um, and, and yes, hundreds of, of servers that are, that are uh, computing for Bitcoin transactions and really validating and verifying transactions on the Bitcoin network. So in the last few months, we've seen this idea of oil and gas majors getting into Bitcoin mining really normalize. Announcements about ConocoPhillips and Exxon having skin in the game didn't do much to their share price. And if anything, a lot of people are actually making the case that this serves their overall ESG narratives quite well. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. That's really how we've positioned Crusoe is we, we're trying to build the, the largest scale and most ESG and climate aligned Bitcoin mining company in the world. Really, we feel there's no better way to produce power for Bitcoin than to capture otherwise flared natural gas. 
Um, there's also some very interesting strategies around renewables and other carbon-free sources of power that, that are getting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of attention and they should. Um, but, but in terms of eliminating methane in a 24 seven hour, a 24 seven process that can really scale, that's so exciting from both an economic and environmental standpoint. Uh, that's what we're, you know, really building out here at Crusoe. Um, I, you know, I, I, I spoke, I was the keynote speaker at the Digital Wildcatters Conference in Houston over the last couple of days, which was really a conference around energy industry and Bitcoin coming together and talking about these solutions. And my whole keynote was about learning the lessons from the shale industry's uh, recent history that, that, that would be important to learn for Bitcoin's second decade. And if we don't learn about the importance of public perception, reputation, ESG, listening to and actually responding to and acting on the legitimate climate concerns, then history is going to repeat itself. And you're going to see the same kind of, uh, you know, sort of public scrutiny, pushback and, and, and regulation um, that, that in some cases maybe went, you know, too far um, that, that sh- could have been addressed through more communication and engagement and dialogue. We, we can probably see the same dynamics playing out on the Bitcoin side. And it's about getting ahead of these things and talking about them and actually acting on them with good clean energy sources and 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 ESG aligned strategies. Now, with the U.S. blocking Russian energy imports and President Biden pushing for more oil drilling at home in the U.S. to tamp down on prices at the pump, what does this mean for Bitcoin mining off flare gas? Are we about to see a surge in this business? Well, uh, to, to meet the demands on the oil side, what that's going to mean is a lot of drilling um, and, and pipes take a long time to build and permit and finance. Pipelines are long term projects. So in the in the near to medium term, um, a lot of folks across the industry are expecting to see flaring volumes likely increase in the absence of a solution like a Crusoe that can come out and actually deal with those volumes in a way that's not a pipeline because we can deploy pretty quickly. We can we can be on site. Uh, much faster than a, than a pipeline can typically. In the longer term, we should and we will build pipes, uh, but there's always this mismatch between upstream and midstream. Upstream is usually ahead, running re- really fast, and then midstream will build once those volumes are online and, and established. And, and Crusoe fills a nice role in, in being able to smooth the relationship between the two and capture the volumes when they're being flared at the upfront phase of one of these expansions um, until the pipelines can can catch up. And just really quickly, for someone who doesn't know, upstream versus midstream, can you explain the difference? Sure. Upstream is the drilling and production. It's what people think of when they think of oil wells that are that are there to produce the oil. Midstream is the transportation system and the infrastructure that transports oil and gas volumes to a market, which is then called the downstream. That's the refiners. That's the power generation. That's that's basically what converts the raw commodities into useful end products. Got it. From what I've seen, changes in Bitcoin mining don't really push the price of Bitcoin. This was the case even when China banned the entire crypto mining industry last year. I know that you personally are not in the business of making price calls around Bitcoin, but do you have any thoughts on this whole dynamic between the hash rate of the network and the price of the coin itself? You know, I think the the, the price really responds to market supply and demand forces. Um, it's not directly impacted by hash rate on the network. You know, mining economics are absolutely a function of price of Bitcoin and and market competition on the hash rate side. But uh, if you're if you're purely just interested in the price of Bitcoin, um, they're sort of two different conversations. And I think the bigger factor is you know you've got the four year halving cycle that that usually drives a a press cycle and a sort of uh, perception of scarcity cycle which over the past few halvings, you've seen that that's been a really strong correlation with price movement. Um, so I, I guess, you know, everybody's looking to see that pattern repeat itself or not in the, in the, in the next couple of years as the next halving comes up. But for the last several halvings, um, it's been really consistently a big price driver. Um, and then other than that, it's just the, uh, the sort of buyers and sellers and the balance of supply and demand, you know, on the mining side. And by the way, one of my messages at, uh, at, Digital Wildcatters Empower 2022 conference was um, the word mining, I think, conjures up images in people's minds that are not very, uh, you know, relevant to what actually Bitcoin processing is. And I would suggest the word um, validating 
as the word. I think we are Bitcoin validators. There's really nothing that we're doing that resembles mining. People think of strip mining or coal mining or something. We're talking about a data center and we're, we're really much more like a Visa or a MasterCard processing transactions, validating and securing transactions on the blockchain. Um, so Bitcoin validators, this is my my gentle pitch that maybe the industry should uh, should think about the words that we use to describe ourselves, because I think they do matter, right? Uh, narratives matter, um, you know, me mental models really, really do matter a great deal. Yeah, interesting rebrand idea. You know, part of what's especially interesting about this relationship between the oil and gas industry and Bitcoin mining is that there are a lot of synergies that make this relationship mutually beneficial for the oil and gas guys. It actually helps their ESG initiatives, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, Plus, they make some money in the process and Bitcoin miners get cheap power. I'm wondering whether you can get into this a bit more. Like, what do the oil and gas players have to gain? And, you know, are those benefits just a temporary convenience for now? Or is this the new norm for the oil and gas industry going forward? Yeah, it was it was interesting. I'll go back to the conference. I, I was on a panel with uh, the CEO of one of our producer partners, and, and he made the comments, which are, you know, these wells were going to be drilled with or without the incremental revenue from the Bitcoin mining. We don't pay prices that are going to compete with pipeline prices. If, if he could put that gas into a pipeline, he would. Um, but we pay a price that's higher than zero. So it's better than lighting it on fire and getting zero. But more importantly, it's the ESG side and the flare capture percentage side. He shared that his firm's gas capture percentage last year was at 95%, which was an all-time high for them. And in the absence of Crusoe, it would have been 75%. And so that's a message that he could take to his investors um, and to the state and show you know, real progress on reducing flaring across the portfolio. And yes, there's some incremental revenue, um, but those, are, those wells, their economics are more than 90% driven by oil. So those wells were going to be drilled, and in many cases, they already were drilled, and they already were flaring. And this is just sort of a no-brainer. Why don't we at least reduce the flaring, the environmental impact? And it's back to the public perception. This is the, this is the black eye of the oil industry. And if we're going to need oil for several decades, if not generations, um, which clearly you can see in the current politics, that's, you know, Biden's administration is asking for more oil even, then we should produce that with without the added environmental impact of flaring. You know, I, I think about this as extending the climate runway. We're going to need oil for some period of time. Let's produce it as cleanly as possible with the minimum flaring, the minimum methane emissions, and the minimum waste um, for as long as we need this energy source, which, which we do currently and we're going to for some time yet.